Have you settled into the routine of school and got back into that rhythm of life? You don't sound too happy about it. <laughs> well, as we're glad you're here today. How many of you, you know, we feel like uh, when we're here in this church, we have home field advantage. How many of you know we're fighting a war and a battle that needs to be won? The church needs to win. How many of you believe if Dallas would have played in their home turf, they'd have beat the Bucks Thursday night? Y'all have lots of faith. That's all I got to say. <laughs> We're in this week two of Resilient Family. I, we, we've been noticing, you know, the world follows what God does, even though they don't even know they're following it. They don't. They don't understand that. But uh, and and so when when we started planning a message around resilient family, we we chose that word. And I don't know if you noticed it. My wife and I, I guess, because we were so in tune with that, uh, we. And so I'm going to encourage you this week. Well, for the rest of this series, listen, read, and, and what you read, what you see. Count how many times you hear the word resilient. It's amazing. I think we've probably heard it like 10 or 12 times already, even as we've just been uh, practicing and preparing for these series here. Because you see, God wants us to be resilient. God wants you to be resilient. He wants you to know that you have come back, even though cowboys don't. You have come back power. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. If you're watching us online, we are so honored that you're here today. And I hope that you will just continue to join with us. Pastor Bronson preached a powerful message last Sunday on Resilient Family as he opened up this. If you didn't catch that, if you weren't with us last week, whether you're online or here, you can go to our YouTube channel and pick that up, and I promise you it's going to bless your life. So uh, as he talked last week uh, about the resilient family, um, we, we really want to kind of identify, I just want to kind of make sure we are on the same page as we're talking about this moving forward. Last week we talked about the reality of where our culture and society is today. How many of you know we're not in a Christian society any longer? Six people. Okay. We are, we are not in a Christian society any longer. For the first time in the history of America, we are in a post-modern Christian society, meaning that Christianity no longer has a majority in our culture, in our nation any longer. I don't know if that's news to any of you today, but that is, that's the actuality of where we are. God is not important or the most important thing in our society today. There are people who do not believe in God. There are people who believe that you can have any kind of God. There are people that believe I am the God, you know. Just turn on the TV, you'll see a lot of that. <clears throat> Okay. So, we, wrote a, uh, we read a quote last week uh, in a message uh, from the Disappearing Church that was published by Moody Publishers that said, our imaginations, or excuse me, said that there was a new power and set of beliefs that seized control of both our imaginations and the halls of power. Those seven set beliefs summed up have everything to do with individual freedom reigns. It's reshaping, deconstructing, or destroying anything that tries to restrict individual freedom. Humans are inherently good and any forms of external authority are rejected with, again, personal authenticity being solely celebrated. Now, what I want us to begin today with is to understand that Christianity is in a war and has always been in a war the good versus evil has always been a battle that has been fought from the time that Satan was cast out of heaven with a third of his angels into the realm of the spirit that we cannot see, but he has influence in this world that we're in. But the statement that I want you to hear today is that wars, many wars, are not fought with weapons. Many of those are fought with principles and structures of, of, of a society that go against the popularity of Christianity. How many of you know that the enemy is still alive and well today? He hasn't given up any authority or false authority, let's put it that way. 
And these sets of beliefs that we have talked about, that we quoted, are not only contradicting the Bible, but we see that the same spirit in these beliefs as we do in what we talked about last week. We talked about Babylon and the spirit of Babylon. I want you to understand that is an actual physical location. It's an Old Testament a word. Babylon is actually the country of Iraq. It, it, throughout the Bible, you will see that. So I want you to understand, when we talk about Babylon, we're talking about a physical place where King Nebuchadnezzar ruled, and it has been in confusion for thousands of years because it has continued to hold on to the spirit of evil and not of God. So the society of the Old Testament, we read in Daniel chapter 1, as we did last week, King Nebuchadnezzar did one thing. He, he took over the city. He besieged the city of Jerusalem and destroyed the scrolls of the temple of God. He destroyed the things that represented Christianity, the scrolls and the temple. He wanted to wipe them out completely so their society would have no monuments, no remembrance of what they had been taught and trained throughout their lives. He kidnapped thousands of Jerusalem's youngest children and brought brought them in, they were the brightest and the smartest, and brought them back to Babylon there because his message and his, uh, his identity was going to change those children into Babylonians, from Israelites, from the children of God to the children of evil. He wanted the culture and the customs and the beliefs and the spirit of Babylon to be in them from, the, from that moment on. He had a plan. And that spirit of Babylon, as we learned last week, is an attitude, a system, a worldview, way of thinking that is bent on destroying the people of God. Wherever the people of God are and go, this demonic spirit of Babylon follows the people of God with one thing in mind. He wants to manipulate, distort, and counterfeit the kingdom of God. He wants to show people enough of the truth that isn't the truth so they never experience the truth. How many of you feel like every time you turn on the TV, you're not getting the truth? That every time somebody tries to report something, he said, that doesn't sound exactly right because it's not. That's what the spirit of Babylon does. It masks and masquerades truth, all just putting enough in it to make you think it is truth when it actually is not. The Spirit appears all throughout the Bible. From Genesis chapter 11 through Revelations 14, 16, 17, and 18, you can read about that Spirit of Babylon. And it's still after God's people today. How many of you feel like that your, your, your privileges as a Christian are being infringed upon? That your rights as a Christian to believe what you want to believe, that there is a God, is being taken away, it's being stolen, it's being diminished and demolished under the Spirit of Babylon. We don't call it that, or they don't call it that, but we identify it as that. This is a spirit, this is spirit, is very much in the culture of our kids in our world today. How many of you hear your kids talking sometimes and you think, where did they get that thought from? Because I haven't been teaching that. I haven't been telling them that. They haven't been doing, listening to that when, when they're around me, but they're picking it up from where? Their friends, their school, maybe other families that they, they have been allowed to communicate with or be a part of. That's what our community is facing today. But I want you to know that there is still hope. How many of you love hope? There is hope because every time you read in the Bible where the enemy came against the children of Israel or the people of God, he always raised up someone to lead them forward in victory and power and authority because he has never left the throne. He said in his word, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And this series is to help us to become and to raise up, to become and raise up some Daniels in our society, in our culture today, in our world today. You say, well, well, who was Daniel? If you've never read that story, I want to make sure you understand. As we talked last week, Daniel was only 13 years old when he raised up before a king who had all power and authority to snuff his life out with one word. And he said, I will not bend nor bow to you as a king because my king is God the Father. 
You see, we need to raise up Daniels in our society today. You as parents need to raise up your children to be the Daniels in your world today because God has already given us all power and authority to speak life and to speak power and the authority that he has already given is ours to now attach into our lives. To have that spiritual maturity and practical handles to raise up the, this next generation we, we, when they have come up against so many pivotal moments in their life, the Spirit of God would rise up within them and they can say exactly what Daniel said in Daniel 1.8. He said, but Daniel made up his mind. Daniel, he didn't say he looked it up on Facebook. Daniel made up his mind. I, that I'm not going to defile myself before this king. I am going to honor God. You see, this is heavy and hopeful all at the same time. We read it last week. Parents, it's time we become leaders for our homes and start raising leaders in our homes. You have the authority and power. God has given you that, to do that with your children, to do that with, with your own life and in your home. You see, what we must first understand as parents is we are image bearers we are the image bearers in this society today you see i think the problem is is that we focus too much on the outward image and not the inward image we, we are too concerned uh, about what other people are saying about the way we look or the way we talk or the way we act instead of saying man i see the god in you I see spirit, I see life, I see an overcoming. I, you, you, every time you face a difficulty, man, you just blow through it like it's nothing. How do you do that? You do it because you have the power of the image of God in you. How many image bearers do I have in the room today? Are you here today? Turn to that person next to you and say, you're an image bearer. You're an image bearer for the kingdom of God. And it's not just parents, but it's those of you that are single here in this room you're an image bearer. Whether you have children, whether you have a spouse or not, you're still an image bearer. Kids in this room, young people in this room, you're an image bearer. People see you. Yes, they see this image. And, and you know what? You can't change this image. You know, you look like your parents. You can't mess that up. They messed it up for you. So quit worrying about what the outside looks like. Start worrying about what the inside is reflecting. Let it reflect the image of Jesus, and they will forget about the outside because you have something on the inside that they won't. We are image bearers, God's image bearers in this world today. All that means is we reflect God's nature, his attributes, his character, and the rest of the creation that he has made a part. We are the optical, the visible counterpart of God in this world today. That's what he's called us to be. And we first read about us being made in the image of God. Do you know you're in the, you were made in the image of God? And I need to ask you, what part of God are you? What part are you taking? Him. I'm going to give you something to think about in just a moment, but I want to read this. How we understand we, became, we be, have become a part of the image of God. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27 says, Let us make mankind in our image and our likeness. This was God speaking. I'm, I'm assuming he was probably talking to, to Jesus, to the Holy Spirit, you know, maybe to some angels that were hanging around the throne. He said, let us make mankind in our image and our likeness so that they may rule over the fish of, in the sea and the birds in the sky and over the livestock and all wild animals and over all creatures that move along the ground. Verse 27, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created you. It says them there, but I'm telling you, he created you. Turn that person next to you and say, he created you. Now, here's the thing that I want you just to, you know, it, it may bend your mind just for a while of that, but I want you to pray out this out. I want you to understand this. Maybe it'll help you kind of lose a little bit of this outside image and develop more of the inside image. I want you to see that, that you are a spirit with a body of flesh. 
You're not a body of flesh with a spirit. You are a spirit first. Before you ever got a body, you were a spirit. Because God conceived you in heaven before he ever gave you a body to navigate this earth with. And I don't know if you know this yet, but when you leave this earth, you ain't taking this body. You're going as a spirit to heaven because they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. (laughs) Quit worrying about what this body looks like and start worrying about what the spirit looks like. You may say I'm wrong on that, but I'm still going to say I'm right. From the moment we were created by God, our Heavenly Father, he gave us an image, a likeness of himself. He said, you are my reflection. You are what I want people to see in this world that you will pass through. You know you're not going to live here forever. You're just passing through. Your life is just a mist, a vapor, here today and gone. From the beginning, our Heavenly Father saw the importance of of giving his children an identity. Your children have an identity. They have an identity through you, number one. Because they have, you have taught them things you don't even know you taught them. They do things because you do them. My wife said the other day, that sounds just like my mother. She was talking. <laughs> I did not agree. Because I'm smarter than that. creating within us, God, not only an identity, but put a capacity for us to be an image bearer for him, to have a likeness of him in our everyday lives. How we talk is a reflection of the image of who he is in us. How we act is a reflection of the image of of who he is in us. How we think and how we talk, uh, interact with one another is the reflection of who he is in us. I know y'all are too young for this, the majority. But you remember when they used to have carnivals that come to town? And they had this one, one, one thing that I always, you know, thought, why do people do that? But, you know, I usually went in, paid my whatever it was, 50 cents or a dollar. And it was the mirror room. You remember those, the mirror room? And you walk into that mirror room, and, there, you know, you walk into one of them, and, and you, you'd be like real tall and skinny, you know, and you'd turn sideways, and you couldn't see yourself. And then you walk to the next one, and you'd be real, like, little small and fat. <laughs> you see, there's a mirror room. If I, could, if I can tie that into the Holy Spirit, the mirror room is a reflection. When you walk into that mirror room, what part of God do you see in yourself? A part of Jesus is a reflection. Is you turn sideways and you can't see him? Or do you turn and see the fullness and the fatness of God in us? Hey, I'm fat on God. And Bluebell and some other things. (laughs) We are image bearers. The image we bear is the filter our children will view God through. Let me say that again. The image we bear is the filter our children will view God through. Before they have an understanding or an identity of who they are in Christ, they will see God in you. They will see a reflection, an image of who God is. In other words, how our children see God derives from our behavior how we react to things. Are we generous? Then if we are generous people, then they're going to say, you know what, God must be generous. If, If you're forgiving, when little Johnny eats all 12 cookies that you made, and you jump down his throat and tell him how bad he is because he was so selfish and ate all the cookies, You say, you know, Johnny, I did that too one time. (laughs) And they were good cookies, weren't they? (laughs) He will love it because you'll show him that God is a forgiving God. If you see an easily disappointed 
if you're seen easily disappointed, if you're seen that your life is too busy, that you're not present in the moment, God will be seen the same way. He's too busy for them, too busy for their problems, too busy for their conversations, and he's not there. And fathers, the, the character and nature you reflect I have to stress this to you as the man of the house, as the leader, the image, the character, the nature you reflect is how your children will see God. Do you lead them with love? Do you lead them with patience? Do you lead them with hope? Or are you just the disciplinarian, the taskmaster? Mothers, uh, I'm not going to let you off the hook either. The character and nature you reflect is how the child sees themselves. The character and nature of how you reflect is how the child sees themselves. Are you a loving parent? A nurturing parent? A parent that stays up all night long? When the children are sick, tending to them, caring for them, singing songs to them, then they will see that's the way God wants to treat them as well. As an image bearer of parents, the truth is we are always bearing an image. But the question is, what image is it? What are we portraying? How many of you have cell phones? Okay, some of you, they're real cheap right now. Just saying. Christmas is 16 weeks away. I don't know if you knew that or not. But if you have a cell phone, I'm going to give you the IG, the tweet, the, the, the FB quote of the day. And you won't even have to do anything else for the rest of the day but watch football. So pull out that phone. Let me see how fast you can put them thumbs into action. Because here's the tweet that you need to make sure you post and also tag live the life so they know, you know, it comes from us. Here it is. Whatever or whoever is most important in your life is the image you will reflect. <laughs> you can put that on the end of that t uh, uh, post as well. Ooh. Whatever or whoever is the most important in your life is the image you reflect. How many of you look at some people's Facebook posts and they always got images of some, you know, celebrity or some somebody else, da, 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 you know, and you're like, man, you must not have a life. And you try to talk to them about anything, and it's always going back to, oh, did you see her, what she was doing? And oh, this is what I'm doing. And did you see that guy? Oh, boy, he did a great job with that. Better. And you're like, but, but what about the image bearer that you are? What has God done in your life? See, please hear me out here. My prayer is that you would see how important your relationship with God is. Is Facebook wrong? No. Is Instagram wrong? No. There's some good things that do happen in those sites, those, those social media platforms. But your relationship with God is more important than any of that because you can only reflect what your relationship, what, you can only reflect what you're in relationship with. So as a parent adult, my first priority is growing my relationship really with Jesus because if I don't have a relationship with him, my relationships, all my relationships are going to be off. Because it's the only way I can bear his image is if I have a relationship with him. And from my relationship with Jesus, I am going to naturally, naturally, it's not going to be a forced thing. I'm going to naturally reflect his image for, for family, children, and for everybody around me. Now, that's not saying that we're always going to be perfect. How many has made a mistake or two in your life? And the greatest thing you can do when you make a mistake is ask for forgiveness. 
Not try to sweep it under the rug. Not trying to say, well, you know, everybody makes mistakes, so I'm just one of them. No, just go ahead and, and be man up and say, you know what? I made a mistake. Or woman up. And I made a mistake. This wasn't right. Forgive me. And move on. Asking for forgiveness is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of maturity and strength. Matthew chapter 12, verse 35 and 37, it says, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil out of the evil stored up in him. It goes on to say, well, I'm going to hold off on that to later. See, it's our responsibility to mold and shape our children into Christ bearers. The Barna Group is a research group that, that canvasses and um, identifies issues in the church and really out of the church as well. And a few years ago, they did a research and a study and recognized that there's a segment of, of young people in our world today that basically walk away from church and Christianity at a certain age and a time span. And that age group is from 18 to 25. The largest group of young people that walk away from church is that age group between 18 and 25. They begin to ask, I wonder why that is. And the reason for that was is that they had not had an image bearer in their life of who Jesus is. They had gotten to the place and the point of maturity where they could make decisions on their own, but because there hadn't been a reflection and an image of leadership in their home to the things of God, they looked outside. As I started out this message with, and I said, I believe that we are being challenged as a church, as Christian believers of faith in our world today to, to sub be suppressed and to be undermined and to be for, for pushed to the side and have no voice and no authority. And I believe the church, and this is my own personal conviction today, I believe the church has sat silent for far too long with closed lips and a closed mind and a comfortable attitude, believing that, oh, it's going to get better. We just waited until Jesus comes when God has said to us, I have given you all power and authority over this world and it's your turn to take it back from the enemy. I believe he's saying, wake up church, wake up church. It is our time. It is our time. I was being a good pastor yesterday and I was sitting on the couch yesterday morning and I was reading through this message and my wife comes in and sits down and she turns on and starts looking at Apple Music. How many of you have one of those cell phones that um, has Apple Music on it? I didn't know we had Apple Music. <laughs> but Friday night, she asked me, what is this $3.99 charge to Apple? And I said, I don't know. I guess the grandkids downloaded something. She popped it up. She said, it's Apple Music. I didn't know we had it. I don't use it. So I'm sitting reading through my message yesterday morning. She comes in and sits down on the sofa and starts playing through the Apple Music. And a song came on. Does, does Apple Music have Christian music? Oh, it does. Okay. It wasn't a Christian song. But as I'm reading through this, she's playing Apple Music. A song comes on, and God says, listen to this. And I believe if God told me to listen to this, he also wants you to listen to this. So point your attention to the screen.
I believe that's the exact posture that the church of this 21st century is taking. It's taking the authority and the power that God has given us to change the world. We're just sitting back and saying, man, go change the world. Somebody change the world. Let's get a new government to change the world. Let's, get, let's believe in this. It'll change the world. No, God has said to you, I have given you all power and authority to change your circumstance, your situation, your world. Rise up, wake up, wake up, and change the world. So how do we mold and shape our children to be Daniels, to be world changers, to be people called according to the purpose, knowing the power and authority that's been given by the hand of God. We speak God's word into their life every day. How many parents do I have in the room today? Raise your hand. How many grandparents do I have in the room today? You see, it takes a a village and a tribe to raise a child. So, you know what? And we're not just going to put it all on parents. We're going to put it on all of us. It's time to raise our children up to be the Daniels in their younger years, to stand against the principles and the principalities of the enemy and say, I am not going to bend the knee. I am not going to go along with your version of my life. I am going to choose the life that God has given me. You speak words, God's words. So let's go back to the children. If you remember from the Israelites, the children being kidnapped by Babylon, they were, uh, they were there to learn a whole new language. They had been taken out of their country, out of their nation, away from their parents to be indoctrinated into the Babylonian theology. And Daniel 1.5 says... He ordered Aspenas to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. And he ordered they be educated for three years, at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. Nebuchadnezzar said, it'll only take me three years to wipe away every ideal that they ever had about their faith in Israel, in, Israel, in Jerusalem, about, about their God and about their king. It'll only take me three years to indoctrinate my, my, those children with my principles and my way of doing things. And I will cho- I'll teach them how to serve my God. Three years. Now, we're not saying everything is all about the devil. So you should try to shun your kids and and hide them away in their bedrooms. My experience has been that when that happens, they do run buck wild. But it's our responsibility to teach them. But what I do want you to see is a comparison between how much time your child is being educated in the things of the world and how much time he's being educated in the things of God. You want to see this? It's, it's pretty, pretty eye-opening. If you're thinking that one hour of Sunday worship back there is going to just totally seal them and conceal them from the enemy, that's a, that's a, that's a precept that's not going to hold true. Here's what we need to know. If we want to think of this kind of in the terms of food and sleep, how many of you like food? And how many of you like sleep? How many of you, you put that together, you're going to get very fat and lazy? <laughs> just, just, you know, threw that out there for you. So let's talk about your kids. How well would your kids function if they're, there's a total of 168 hours in each week? How well would they function if they only ran on two hours of sleep. Because they get about an hour back here. If you send them to, to uh, Wednesday night service for the youth, they'll get an hour there. You, you, you know, they may, may spend up to probably a maximum of two hours. If they had to function on two hours of sleep, would you think they would be very productive? Okay. How well would your kids perform if... In that 168-hour week, you only fed them, like, for two hours. Now, your food bill would go down, right? But would they be productive? No. You would see CPS at your door saying, you got to feed these kids. 
But we believe that we can survive or they can survive on two hours of spiritual development on a Sunday or maybe one day other a week when they have 168 hours that the enemy is constantly bombarding them with negativity and all kinds of other accusations that are not true because they don't come from God into their lives. And we as the church and as families of God have to rise up in this moment and begin to circle around our children and begin to speak life and truth and power and the authority over them. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 7 says, and this was Moses speaking, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. He was saying, there's some principles that you need to apply into their lives that is your responsibility as a parent. Moses was instructing, there are four times that you need to make sure that your children know that you're praying for them, that you're speaking over their lives, and that you know that God is going to do something miraculous for them in their lives. Number one is when they go to bed. How many of your children sleep? How many of you are glad when they go to sleep? I tell you what, start praying over them. They'll go to sleep faster. Pray over them. They need to hear you praying God's prayers over their life. God, I just pray that the anointing of your Holy Spirit will rest on them tonight as they sleep. And when they wake up in the morning, they will have God thoughts and they will have God dreams throughout this night. And the presence of your Spirit, O oh Lord, will encourage them and strengthen them for the day and the task for tomorrow. They need to hear your prayer over their lives. And the second thing they need to hear is when they're sitting around in the house. They don't need to be listening to music. They don't need to be watching their favorite cartoon shows. They need to be hearing you pray preaching and praying and prophesying over their lives that God has called you into this earth for such a time as this. You're going to be an Esther. You're going to be a Daniel. You're going to be a child of God. You're going to make a difference. You're going to lead people into the faith and into the loving nurturing of Jesus Christ because you have a voice, my child. You have a voice. The third thing they're going to recognize is when they get up in the morning, when you're packing their lunch or you're cooking their breakfast, whatever, they need to hear you singing the songs of praise over their lives. My child, you say, I can't sing. I can't either. Don't worry about it. Just, just make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Oh, God, this is the child of my dream because you have placed this miracle in my life. I praise you, oh, God, for their love and for their life. Continue to lead them, oh, Lord, for I will serve you forever. Just hear them pray in the morning when they are waking up praising him and you praying over their lives and when they're going somewhere how many of you know your children like to get out from under your wing they love to get out from under your wing at certain points in times sometimes they think it's a good idea and then sometimes they think it's not we were at a funeral yesterday and we we're getting ready to leave we we're all going to go to a restaurant to eat and, and uh, one of my littlest grandchildren, Shar Shar, and she said, Papa, I want to ride with you. Papa, I want to ride with you. I said, okay, go ask your mom. She goes, that's her mom. mom. She comes back and says, mom says yes. Mom says yes. So I said, all right, well, let's go. So mom was like, you know, right there, and I'm right here, and she's looking at me, and she's looking at mom, and she's looking at me, and she's looking at mom, and mom won. She, it was a good idea to she thought to start, but then when the actuality came to making that choice and that decision, I want to go with my security. I want to go with that one who's been praying over me, who's been speaking life into me, who's been believing in me, who's been speaking the words of hope into my life. I'm going to go with them. No, she just don't know I do that yet. But when they're going somewhere, every time we speak to our children the word of they will continue to grow in strength. The authority and the anointing and maturity so they can overcome the temptations and the distractions of the world. Number two, speak life through our words. The power of life and death is in the tongue. You need to hear that one more time. I said the power of life and death is in the tongue. You can curse your children or you can bless them. He gave us his power to create things with our words. You can create what you want through your words. At, at the same funeral, we all went to that restaurant and we were eating yesterday and kind of finishing up and how everybody does, you just kind of stand up and start saying your goodbyes. And a member of the family came to me and he said, you must be real proud of your sons. It's my oldest son, Brandon, and 
And uh, Brian, my third son, officiated the service yesterday for the family member. And I said, yes, we are tremendously proud of our children. And he said, but how, how did you get them there? How did you get them to follow into the things of God? To become like you is essentially what he was saying in the ministry. And I said, I've had that question asked to us, my wife and I, have had that question asked to us probably a thousand plus times in our lives. And here's our standard answer because it's the only answer. It's the true answer. When they were still growing in her womb, we laid hands on that rising stomach and prayed, God, you're creating this child for a purpose that we may not know and understand now, but we know it's for your kingdom and for your purpose. And we just want to be the parents to lead them and guide them in the truths of your righteousness for your name's sake so that they will have the power and authority to do what you have called them to do. In Jesus' name, let them rise and become men of faith and of God. In Jesus' name. And if you're pregnant or if you, you have had a child or your children are already up in age, it doesn't matter. Continue to pray. Continue to seek God. Continue to speak life into their hearts and into their spirits. Because what you speak, you create. Some people would say it's a coincidence. <laughs> well, they just did it because you did it. Man, I ran from the ministry as far as I could, as long as I could, and as hard as I could until I almost destroyed everything that God blessed me with in my life. That's another story and another sermon. They didn't follow me. They followed the prayers that we had prayed. <laughs> Children will live up to the words you speak. Children will live up to the words that you speak over them. You see, if we speak negativity into their lives, guess what? It's probably going to happen. If you say things like, you know, you're going to end up just like, you know, whomever, you know, your worst enemy is, they're probably going to end up like that. If you tell them, you're just like your, and you fill in the blank, you know. You know what? That's exactly what they're going to emulate. What words you speak, your tongue gives life or death. They will listen, they will hear, and they will remember. I want you to look at the other half of Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. We read the first half. I'll read it again. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For your words you will be acquitted, and by our words you will be condemned. Have you ever said something you wish you could take back? No, it doesn't work that way. You know, I, I have to admit, I, I've said some things in my life that I wasn't proud of. And one day I'm going to stand face to face with God. And those words are going to flash up before us again. You might say, well, are you afraid? No. Because my God is a forgiving God. My God is a loving God. My God is a compassionate God. And when I said those words that I knew were not right, I asked for forgiveness. And if I said those to someone else that offended them, I went back and said, hey, that wasn't right. I was completely wrong, and I did not bear the image of God to you in that moment, and I need your forgiveness. Did you catch what that scripture said? That we'll have to give an account of every word? You see, the most powerful parent principle we can come across in the Bible is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3. It says, but the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. You can say, well, I'm not a prophet. That's not what it's saying. It's not saying you have to be a prophet 
It says, but the one who prophesies. So let me, let me say this. When you declare something over your children, you're prophesying over them. When you speak over them good things, life things, God things, you're prophesying over them. When we declare that, that's what it means. Pray and declare over their lives, over their future, over their spouses, over every part of their lives. Prophesying is when you speak into someone's life, building them up, giving them faith, the hope and the confidence that they need so desperately in their lives because they have believed way too many of the enemy's lies over them. Prophesying is actually a combination of speaking life with your words. Speak life. Speak life. Parents, when you get in the car and you're ready to go home today, your children jump in there, prophesy over them. Speak life over them. Don't make it some spooky, scary thing. Tell them, bow your heads, close your eyes. I'm going to (laughs) prophesy. They're going to say, is it Halloween already? It's beginning to pour into them words of affirmation that God wants you and wants them to hear. It's our responsibility. Not only to grow in our relationship, but help and encourage them to grow in theirs. Because just like you, they've been called according to his purpose. Just like you, they were born into this world at a certain space and time to be an impact and an influence into our world. I want to encourage you to be all of that. The best image of Jesus. Not only to your children, not only to your spouse, not only in your home, not only to your family, but to the world. Would you stand to your feet with me right now? For those at home, I want to thank you for being a part of this with us today. I don't know what you're facing in your life, whether you're online or you're in this room. But I know this. Our God is still a miracle, still a miracle working God. I've seen it happen throughout my lifetime. I've seen things that were so desperate, that were so broken, that seemed so demolished that nothing could ever bring them back to life. Many times that was relationships. Many times that was even life. And I've seen the hand of God touch, reach down out of heaven and touch the situation and the life and the heart and instantly things changed. I've also watched the simple progression of things in people's lives as they continue to open their hearts to become the image bearer of Christ and they become a truer and truer and truer reflection as they allow more and more of God. So I have a question for you today. Do you feel like in this room that you're an image bearer, the best image bearer, of Jesus Christ you could be today? Are you the best reflection that this world, this culture, this society, our city, our nation, our world needs to see? Are you the best reflection of Jesus? Answer that for myself, and I want you to answer that. But I, I believe I can do better. I believe I can be a better image bearer for Jesus than I am. I believe I can speak more life and more hope, and, and I can carry that image into atmospheres and societies and cultures and places that maybe not want it or understand it. The second question I need to ask you today is 
Do you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Because we cannot bear an image or be a reflection of something we don't know. So would you just bow your heads right now? I want this to be a private moment between you and God. And if you're in this room and you say, Steve, I, I want a relationship with Jesus Christ. I, I, I want to be an image bearer. But I know I need to know him. Maybe you've accepted him before in your life or maybe you have never done that and you're just ready to take that step of faith. If that's you today in this room and you say, I'm going to take a step of faith and I'm going to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior so I can be an image bearer to my world, to my family, to my children, to my spouse. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ or it's been a while since you've made that statement, would you just raise your hand right where you are and say, Steve, I need that in my life. I want that. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now let me ask you, the, the first question I asked is, could you be a better image bearer for Jesus in our world today? Could, could you do something different? Maybe change a little bit of the way you act, the way you think, the way you react to situations so that more of the image and the reflection of Jesus would shine through. And people would not recognize you so much for the outside, the outward image, but for the Jesus that shines through. And I'm going to ask you simply, whether you're at home or you're in this room, if you want to be more of an image bearer for Jesus, would you just raise your hand today and say, I do, I do, I do. I certainly do. And let's pray for those who lifted their hands and say, you know what, I want, to, I want to take this step of faith. Hold on. Become an image bearer for the truth of Jesus. Let's pray together. If it's okay, grab that person's hand next to you. The Bible tells us to join hands together and pray one for another. For in it, we acknowledge the power of Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this moment, for this service, for this time. I pray, God, that you would wake us up from the slumber of our place in this world today. God, for those who lifted their hands and say, Jesus, I'm coming to you. I'm taking that step of faith. I'm crossing over to believe that you have all of everything I need. And I want to become more of an image bearer for you. I want more of a reflection of you in my life. And so I give you my heart, my mind, my soul, and my spirit. From this day forward, I will serve you all the days of my life. God, we just thank you and we give you praise for your presence, for your spirit, for your anointing, but most of all, for Jesus Christ, who bled and died and rose again so that we could have authority in his name. And we pray in Jesus' name. Well, thank you so much for checking out this week's message. We pray that it encouraged you and also gave you practical handles and tools on how to continue to build that firm family to withstand this changing culture. Now, if you or one of your family members made the decision to follow Jesus, we want to know about it so we can celebrate you with you, but also walk alongside you as you walk this new faith journey. Head over to our app or church website and fill out the life change card there. Also, make sure you are subscribed to this YouTube channel, like it, and share it to encourage someone this week. We love you guys, and we'll see you back here next week.